Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we're very happy to have you as part of the Medic Alert uh, Live Healthy Hour series. Take it from there. Thank you, Julie. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, I'm Melody Howard, Director of Community Alliances at Medic Alert Foundation, and Julie, our Vice President of Communications, is joining me as our co-host. Thank you so much for those of you who have rejoined us today um, for another healthy hour. And for those who are new, a very warm welcome to you. Today's agenda, um, we'll be talking about Medic Alert, um, COVID-19 Q&A with Dr. Ricardo Perfetti, and we'll share some resources for you at the end. So for those of you who joined us, um, again, welcome back. We're glad that you decided to join us again. And for those of you who may not be familiar with Medic Alert, I'd like to take a few moments to share information with you about our life-saving organization. Um, we are the original medical ID created in 1956. What's so unique about Medic Alert is that we go beyond just an ID. Our IDs are backed by our dedicated emergency response team 24 seven. This team is always standing by to relay your critical medical information to those treating you in an emergency. Medic Alert is the only nonprofit organization in the medical ID space. All of our revenues fund our emergency services and help provide IDs and memberships to people in financial need. Our mission remains unchanged over the last 64 years, and that is to help save and protect lives by sharing vital information in our members' moments of need. Here's how our service works. Your medical ID is engraved with the most vital medical information that emergency responders need to know right away in order to treat you. In an emergency, they contact our 24-7 emergency response team to get your full health record. Your health record includes information such as health data and emergency contacts, which again, we relay to emergency personnel. We've trained emergency responders to look for your medical alert ID and empowering them with vital information that you've given us. Um, it's so important for first responders to know about any existing conditions so that you get the best care. Medical alert is your voice when you need us most. I think the other thing I would add there, Melody, is that um, especially for people with diabetes um, and if they're insulin dependent, having a, a first responder know that right away in emergency can be so critical to making sure that they get the, the right kind of care. Absolutely. Thank you, Julie. Today, I'm delighted to introduce you to our very special guest, Dr. Ricardo Perfetti. He's the Chief Medical Officer from Applied Therapeutics. Um, Dr. Perfetti has served as Applied Therapeutics Chief Medical Officer since August of 2018. Prior to that, Dr. Perfetti served as a Senior Medical Officer, Vice President, and Head of Global Medical Affairs, Diabetes and Cardiovascular Business Unit at Sanofi SA, a publicly traded pharmaceutical company from 2007 to 2018. Prior to joining there, Dr. Perfetti served in various roles at Amgen Incorporated, a publicly traded biopharmaceutical company, including as a director and global development leader in diabetes, obesity, metabolism, and endocrinology from 2004 to 2007. Dr. Perfetti was previously an associate professor of medicine at University of California in Los Angeles and a professor of medicine at the National Institutes of Health, or NIH. Dr. Perfetti practiced as an endocrinologist at Cedar sinai Medical Center and also served as the director of the Diabetes Research Laboratory and director of the Outpatient Diabetes Program. Dr. Perfetti received his MD and PhD in endocrinology from University of La Sapienza in Rome, Italy, and received postgraduate training in endocrinology and molecular, molecular biology at NIH. Welcome, Dr. Perfetti. Thank you, good afternoon. So um, we'll get right into um, asking some questions of you, Dr. Perfetti. Thanks to everyone for their great questions that they submitted. We did receive a lot of questions. We'll try to get it to as many of those as we can. Um, time may be a constraint for us, but we will um, tackle as many as possible. We're gonna answer questions in the following categories. COVID risks for people with diabetes, 
COVID prevention, diabetes and COVID, and ready for reopening. Julie, Thank you for those, Melody. Um, we did receive literally hundreds of questions, and so many of them were people who've been hearing a lot about uh, in the media, in the news, that um, you know you are at risk if you have diabetes in this uh, very uncertain time around this global pandemic. So. Um, Dr. Perfetti is really going to help us understand kind of the different nuances of that and um, what that means for people with diabetes. So let's get into it. Great. So in our first category, COVID risk for people with diabetes, we had several folks who asked the same question. Virginia, Harold, Tammy, and Thomas ask, do people with diabetes have a higher risk of contracting COVID-19? Thank you, Melody. Well, I'd like to start by thanking the uh, Med Alert team for organizing this uh, forum. I think it's always important for uh, patients and their family to have a venue where questions could be asked and there is a uh, discussion and debate and some of the uh, critical issues are addressed or so initiated to be addressed. This question, which is our first one, is one of the most critical ones for patients with diabetes. Today, we don't really have a clear evidence that patients with diabetes are more susceptible to the infection per se. So in other words, we don't really have evidence that being diabetic per se make you more likely to be infected. Uh, however, we do have strong evidence that if an individual with diabetes develops uh, a COVID-19 infection, that person may evolve in a little bit more severe manner than an individual who does not have diabetes. So the reason why we don't really know whether patients with diabetes are more likely to be affected is because today, we have primarily data from people admitted in the hospital. So people that are admitted in the hospital are more likely people with diabetes. And that percentage vary between 20 and 50%. Wow. Thank you. Our second question also in the same category, submitted by Debbie, Patricia, Susan, Vera, Tim, and many others. So it's a very popular question. Um, why are people with diabetes at a higher risk of complications and serious illness from COVID-19? Yeah, so first of all, that, that is, is a fact. So we are learning that uh, uh, people infected by COVID-19, if they have diabetes, they more likely are susceptible to progress and to have a more severe outcome. Now, why is that? Well, there are, there, there are many different aspects that could explain that. So in general, the uh, um, immunological response and the inflammatory response in patients with diabetes is altered. One of the reasons why we recommend all patients with diabetes, for example, to have the seasonal flu immunization is because we want to protect them uh, because we know that they're more, more vulnerable. We also know that many people with diabetes have some degree of um, organ impairment. Uh, some Patients with diabetes have a comorbidity of hypertension. Some of them have some degree of renal impairment. So there is a substrate from a biological point of view of greater susceptibility. Now, the why, which is the beginning of the question, is the most important uh, component, right? So recently, we have identified that uh, some of the quote unquote port of, port of entry, the way the virus get in a cell, are mechanisms that in patients with diabetes may be altered. One is called ACE2, is a receptor that mediates the interaction with uh, a molecule to regulate blood pressure. Another port of entry is called DPP4. This is a, a protease and a, a, a mediator in uh, some cat catalytic activity. Those two systems 
are two of the potential ports of entry of the virus, and they are altered in patients with diabetes. So perhaps the virus take advantage of a system that has a venue for shunting some of the characteristics and other patients will not be accessible. Thank you. Also in the same category, um, another really popular question from Philip, Ada, Merle, Leanne, and many others. Does COVID-19 impact people with type 1 and type 2 diabetes differently? No, we don't, we don't think so. We don't have evidence that uh, patients with type 1 may be more or less susceptible than patients with type 2 diabetes. There are differences, obviously, between type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Uh, patients with type 2 diabetes, oftentimes, they have multiple comorbidity. Uh, patients with type 2 diabetes are typically older than patients with type 1. But in terms of susceptibility to the infection, we don't have evidence that one of the two is more susceptible than uh, the other. Um, no, we don't have that information. Thank you. Sorry, I'm talking on mute. It sounds like anecdotally, though, uh, some of the people with type 2 may be seeing more of those complications and serious illness just because of those comorbidities that you talked about. Is yes, that right? In fact, it's quite unusual for an individual with type 2 diabetes not to have some of these additional risk factors. And some of those, like obesity or hypertension, are frequently associated with diabetes. In a recent publication of the New England Journal of Medicine, looking at the COVID patients that were admitted in the New York hospital between the beginning of March and the third week of April, actually clustered together hypertension, obesity, and diabetes as the three major comorbidity in patients that were getting admitted. Sometimes, most of the time, they do overlap. Now, in that specific right. study, hypertension was greater as a risk than diabetes per se. Uh, but the numbers are very, very close, and that may also depend on the specific population. We have data that are a little bit more suggesting that diabetes is a greater risk from the UK, also the data from China, but generally speaking, the message is very similar. And as uh, you pointed out, indeed, patients with type 2 diabetes, most of the time, they have some of the comorbidity associated with uh, the increased risk for, for a progression of the infection. Well, also because this pandemic is so new, uh, it's hard for us to have you know, a tremendous amount of sort of longitudinal data to really figure all this out. So it really is learning as we go. Yeah, and many, many countries, including uh, the US, the UK, Germany, Italy, are now conducting uh, more formal epidemiological studies, starting from the population. So if we start from the general population, we may also be able to understand whether the number of infected people, uh, what is the proportion between the infected people and what we call symptomatic people. It's important right. to remember that to be infected doesn't necessarily mean that you will develop the symptoms. You know, like for any infectious disease, a large part of the population do not, doesn't develop symptoms. And among those that develop symptoms is only a small subset that progress. The problem with COVID-19 is that this funnel of infected, the symptomatic progressing is different from what we have been used to. So if many of us would use the seasonal flu as a reference, right, to understand what happened in a setting of a pandemic, in that case, the funnel is very steep, right? So a very large number of people get infected, a very a much smaller number of people have symptoms, and a very tiny one has actually severe symptoms. Now, in this case, those steps are a little bit less steep. So 
little bit too many people are developing symptoms, a little bit too many people are progressing. Right, okay. Um, I think we have a couple more questions around sort of the different nuances of uh, how people with diabetes are impacted. Great. Thank you. Um, submitted by, again by a number of folks also regarding the um, COVID risk for diabetes, people with diabetes. Does increased risk for serious illness apply to people with well-controlled diabetes? How do you define well-controlled versus not well-controlled? And is there a difference for people with type 1 versus type 2? Yeah, so metabolic, metabolic control, so glycemic control, it's uh, critical in patients with diabetes and is in large part uh, a critical determinant of outcomes in general, right, of, of evolution of uh, potential risk. So uh, there are reports from some of the hospitals that manage patients with diabetes and COVID-19 suggesting that uh, patients in poor control are more likely to progress than patients in uh, better control. What is control? Is the same we typically use for patients with diabetes. Up to 10, 15 years ago, we used to say that patients with diabetes should have an HbA1c all below seven. Now we are a little bit more uh, individualizing the target. So for patients that are very early on, many physicians will aim for even a lower target, will aim for a 6.5 of HbA1c. For patients with diabetes and cardiovascular disease, many physicians would um, aim for a target of 7.5. Um, and so, but, but this is not different from what we have learned over the, the last decades, and it's not very different from what any patients with diabetes is told and educated with. So maximizing the quality of glycemic control is a very important mean for any patient with diabetes to minimize the potential for progression uh, of the disease. And um, with this particular one asking, is there a different, is it different for type one versus type two? Yeah, so the, the, the reason why we have a target, we define control is because there are several studies looking at either patients with type one or patients with type two and looking at what is the likelihood for them to develop complications of diabetes. Those are high disease, kidney disease, nerve disease, and heart disease. And they're not very different in terms of risk. So the targets I mentioned before in terms of HbA1c um, are very similar. Now in patients with type one, age is an important factor. So we don't necessarily want young kids to be at a target of seven just because their physical activity is such a variable, but generally speaking, the need to be on target is present in patients for type one and type two. For type one patients, the primary objective or target is the one we just discussed, is glycemic control, right? Although many patients with type one, as they get older, they may develop themselves comorbidity that in the past we thought they were typical of type 2. A little bit less frequent, but still, especially in the United States and in some European countries, we start seeing patients with type 1. They also have obesity, also have hypertension, and they may also develop some of the typical complications of, of uh, diabetes. And I'm mentioning this because then control is no longer limited to glucose only, right? So mm -hmm. as hypertension is another risk factor for the evolution of COVID-19, also controlling blood pressure is critical for patients that in addition to elevated blood sugar, they may have an elevated blood pressure. Thank you, Dr. Yuki. 
So the next question submitted by Mary, Michelle, and Tracy, does the length of time you've had diabetes make a difference in how the virus can affect you? Probably not per se, although obviously the number of years uh, that one individual has diabetes is somehow a proxy of the age of the individual. Not exactly, because obviously with type 1 diabetes, that could be developed very early. So if someone developed type 1 diabetes at age 5, 20 years later, he's still a very young person. So age per se, more than the duration of diabetes, seems to be a predictor. So in other words, it seems to be more relevant our chronological age rather than the years of diabetes to uh, drive the outcome. That makes sense. I think that's probably related to possibly the next question. Let's see. So um, we have several folks who had um, posed these two questions. Uh, Renita, Eric, Robert, Susan, Gatano, and Richard. Is diabetes alone a high risk factor? What if I also have heart disease, high blood pressure, or another chronic condition? And does my risk increase because of my age, 65 plus? And what about obesity? Yeah, so in uh, patients affected by COVID-19, we see much more if the disease evolved uh, in a severe form, we see much more than a respiratory problem, right? We see an inflammatory response that is generalized and affects the lung first, the first uh, organ, the first parenchyma where the virus gets located. But then this inflammatory response, which some people will call uh, inflammatory storm, just to really have a pictorial of the what what happens, start affecting other organs like heart muscle, kidney, and, and, and other organs too. So patients for which those organs may be affected, so for instance, in the setting of high blood pressure, uh, both the kidney and heart are affected by uh, increased blood pressure. Obviously, that increases the risk of progression, not necessarily the risk of being infected. And obviously, age is a critical uh, factor. We have seen that in uh, people younger than age 40, it's very uncommon, the progression, although has been reported in all country, is very unusual, the progression of the disease toward fatality. As people get older, the progression of the disease in a more severe form is more likely. As far as obesity, well, it depends a little bit on the reports that are coming up from different countries. The study published, uh, uh, the study I mentioned just a few minutes ago, published on the New England Journal of Medicine, which was one of the first picture of the situation in New York. New York being hit so early and so massively in the month of March, primarily, well, showed that obesity was the second uh, predictor of uh, progression of the disease. So people with obesity more likely would progress. And again, the observation we made early on that people with obesity may also have diabetes, may also have hypertension, may explain why. So yes, age and obesity are factors that increase the risk for progression. I just saw a question come across the chat that I think is interesting and a little bit related to this, is if, um, if I have diabetes, Am I considered immune suppressed? No, that would be that would be incorrect. So, however, the immune system of um, of uh, uh, patients with diabetes is altered, and uh, someone with diabetes is more susceptible to a certain type of infection. In addition to that. Uh, many patients with diabetes, especially if uh, diabetes is associated with obesity, have an increased inflammatory status. And 
likely the degree of obesity may play a critical role. Um, so to call someone with diabetes immunosuppressed would be, would be incorrect. However, there are some peculiarity in the immune response of patients with diabetes and needs to be taken in, into consideration. That's why, as I mentioned before, for the immunization, we would have very strong recommendation for every seasonal flu, for instance, for patients to make sure they're immunized and for their family members also to be immunized. Right, interesting, thank you. So our next question, also under the category of COVID risk for people with diabetes, submitted by Wendy, Jennifer, and Edith, they're asking, are high triglycerides alone a risk factor for COVID-19? And if I am pre-diabetic, am I also at greater risk? For the first part of the question, increased triglyceride alone are not often alone. So sometimes they're, they're they are not linked to an increase in cholesterol, so that's why why some people would say alone because they are not the most common lipid associated with. But sometimes an increase in level in triglyceride is associated with an increase in inflammatory uh, status or, or with obesity, which is also another pro-inflammatory status. So um, that again doesn't make you more susceptible to be infected as far as we know now. However, to have an inflammatory status that is altered may make you more susceptible to progress. There are no studies looking at triglyceride per se, so what I just said is more based on my own personal intuition on, on this, but when the epidemiological study on population will be available, and that will be very soon, we will be able to answer that question. Patients with prediabetes are not more likely to be infected. Um, if infected, um, much depends on the way they are managed in the clinical setting. With the COVID-19 epidemic, pandemic, we have experienced also many patients developing hyperglycemia during the hospitalization. So in other words, there were many patients that got admitted in, the, in an hospital setting without a diagnosis of diabetes. However, when in the hospital, uh, hyperglycemia was demonstrated in repetitive measure. And this could be in part because these patients were pre-diabetic, so now there is the extra demand and a little bit worsening of their metabolic control. But also some patients, because of this pro-inflammatory status, may require steroid treatment. And as we know, steroids may increase uh, the uh, blood glucose level. So, to, to summarize a very long response, apologies for that. Uh, Pre-diabetes per se doesn't make you more likely to be infected. If you're infected, you develop symptoms, you may have an increased risk for progression. Okay. Great. I think the next couple of questions pertain uh, mostly to uh, type one. We had a, a lot of questions from folks that are uh, type one diabetes. So these questions submitted by Mary and Kathy, are children with type one diabetes at the same risk for COVID-19 as others in the high risk group? And type one diabetics are routinely left out of the national discussions. What COVID risk does a healthy type one face? Yeah, so we, we don't have data suggesting that children with type 1 are a greater risk than children that don't have type 1 diabetes. And maybe the same thinking that we mentioned before, uh, if they get infected, they may develop symptoms. It's possible for patients, children with type 1. 
However, we don't have reports suggesting that they would progress as severely as the adults with type 1. So age today seems to be a very strong determinant of progression. Uh, but the data on diabetes are and COVID are produced on a daily basis. So my answer is very much linked to what we know today. And I'm sure that tomorrow there will be additional report, but today we're not aware of an increased risk of progression in the uh, children with uh, type one. Yeah, well, I mean- been some I'm sorry, Please. go ahead. Uh, well, there's been uh, some interesting things that have come out recently with some unusual syndromes related to COVID in children. Is there any uh, connection there from a diabetes standpoint? It's interesting. That's uh, called Kawasaki uh, syndrome. So there have been reports, um, and in New York there are uh, hundreds of cases, unfortunately, of children that progress. So. Mm, in other words, children that in addition to uh, being diagnosed with COVID-19, they need to be admitted in an hospital setting because they need support. They, they are not just experiencing flu-like syndrome uh, symptoms, they, they're really progressing. And uh, they have some of the feature of an inflammatory response that has been described in Japan many years ago, we call it Kawasaki syndrome and uh, so the, 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 there is a um, there is a lot to learn about this uh, disease and some of the things we said two months ago about being a disease of the elderly and and the young people being protected should not be taken as an absolute the numbers nowadays are so large of people infected that we start seeing it, even population that may be more marginally impacted now start being represented, right? So uh, children are not intrinsically protected. Typically, they progress less severely. However, there have been many exceptions to this. Thank you. Thank you. So the next category of questions falls under COVID prevention. Um, these questions were submitted by Cecile, Vona, Paula, Anne, and Vicky. What can we do to help mitigate the risk for people with diabetes? And are there any special precautions people with diabetes should take beyond masks and hand washing and also social distancing? Well, I think people with diabetes should take similar measure of caution and their family member than anyone else anybody else should take, right? We all should be very cautious. One element that is very important, uh, and it's very well understood probably uh, from by patients with type one, uh, is that the ecosystem in which they operate is also relevant. So the recommendations should not be limited only to the patients, but also to the family uh, surrounding the patients, because we all could be a vehicle of, of infection, even if we are not uh, symptomatic. And indeed we have learned that some of the people that develop, the, the, they get infected, but they don't develop symptoms. They are infectious. They could transmit the disease. So the recommendation for patients with diabetes is to follow the same guidance that we have, that have been given by any public health system to the general population and here we have listed some of them being protected by a mask, make sure they wash their hands, keep the distance from people, making sure that their family member also follow all of this uh, uh, regulation. What in addition patients with diabetes need to do is to make sure their uh, glucose is uh, controlled, right? Because that may be an important facilitator for the infection to evolve, for the infection to progress. Now, if patients with diabetes develops the symptoms after the infection, that need to be not, that need to be triggered to a, a reevaluation of the treatment. 
right? So and I'm sure that that question will come up in one of, likely in one of the next questions, very important. But in terms of prevention of the disease, what for me is critical is that each individual with diabetes understand that the ecosystem in which they live is very important. Many of them will do uh, all of the critical things, but they also need to make sure that their family also understand that. And, uh, and that's, for me, is very critical. Right, and so doing everything the CDC says and then keeping the blood sugar under control are the two primary Absolutely. things. Absolutely, yes. Right. So this question submitted by Ken, is it advisable for diabetics to take a prophylactic medication until a vaccine is developed? Unfortunately, we don't have a prophylactic medication uh, today. We don't really, we need to be always science-based. Uh, there is no prophylaxis from a pharmacological point of view. There is a prophylaxis from hygiene point of view, and it's what we discussed in the previous slide, right? So there have been treatments that have been considered and they're continuing to be studied as a potential um, minimizing for the risk of uh, COVID, but they're not being proven. And we need to remember that each drug comes with a what we call benefit risk, right? We should not forget the risk. All medications come with a risk. So today there are no known prophylactic medication until a vaccine is developed. In the next few months, it's likely that we will see that. We know that many are working at uh, different therapies. I myself have been involved in this personally. And I think what we're going to see in the months to come is uh, several line of research on the identification of vaccine, but also research for people that may be still infected and they need to be treated. So the vaccine, although being critical for us in managing the future infection, will not be the only thing that we need. Um, when an immunization becomes part of a na national campaign, before that immunization protects everybody, you need to have a very, very large number of people be immunized, uh, around 90% of people immunized. And that usually takes about a decade. So we will always need treatment options. So what will happen likely in the next few months are those two line of parallel lines of research treatment for people will get infected hopefully uh, the identification of a vaccine that will protect people from being infected this question on diabetes and covid submitted by carolyn um, when my normally controlled blood sugars run high for no reason, is that a possible indication of COVID-19? Yes, yeah, so, so blood glucose could run high with an obvious, without an obvious reason, uh, not, not that rarely in a patient with diabetes, right? So infections are one of the possibility. Now, it could be COVID-19, it could be anything else. So I would not necessarily link a elevated blood sugar with a knowledge of, or an assumption that is a COVID-19 infection. The typical signs of COVID-19 infections are rather uh, dry cough, fever, uh, uh, muscle pain, some of the typical things that we see with a very bad flu. In some patients, there are also GI symptoms and diarrhea. Um, in that setting, an individual with diabetes will also have an abnormal glucose level, but because the glucose level could change for so many other reasons, I will not necessarily assume that an elevated blood sugar per se may be uh, indicative of a, uh, an infection with COVID-19. Mm -hmm. 
So, ele so elevated blood sugar on its own in the absence of the other symptoms, wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily think of COVID as the culprit. Not, not necessarily. Obviously, as often in medicine we do, the diagnosis is made by different um, elements that contribute. That definitive diagnosis is the, the test, the actual test that now has become a little bit easier to obtain. Thank you. Our next couple of questions submitted by Evelyn, Sandra, and Aline, and also in the category of diabetes and COVID. If I contract COVID-19, should I keep taking my diabetes medications? And does having COVID-19 make it harder to control your blood sugar? Yeah, those are very important questions. And maybe in my view as a physician are the most important question of all. Uh, yes, it's very important for an individual with diabetes to continue the management in terms of glucose lowering. Is the management the same? Likely not. Uh, there are some uh, medications that we use that we have been using for many decades in patients with diabetes. I make the example of metformin. They will not be indicated in a patient that as a result of COVID-19 start developing a respiratory insufficiency, so difficulty breathing or um, deterioration of renal function. So what I'm trying to say is that to make sure that glucose is controlled is absolute, is a must in patients with diabetes. But the way we do it may need to be retailer. So if an individual with diabetes is diagnosed with COVID-19, should certainly discuss with the physician whether the treatment that is on should be left unchanged or not. All depends on the development of symptoms or not, but it's, it's a critical discussion to have. Now, the second part of the question, uh, the answer is probably yes. So there have been reports suggesting that uh, the uh, insulin requirement for those patients needing insulin becomes much greater if infected by uh, COVID-19. I'm not sure whether that is unique. I've seen that most of the time with people uh, with diabetes having an infection, typically the requirement for medication to lower blood glucose increases. But uh, I've seen this perhaps a little bit more obvious with COVID-19 infection. So yes, it may become a little bit harder, but harder doesn't mean difficult, it doesn't mean impossible. It means only different. So if that patient was taking 10 units of insulin, as an example, it's possible they may require more than 10 units of insulin. Um, so uh, it, it's very possible that the management of blood glucose, blood sugar, needs to be readjusted during the asymptomatic phase of the disease. So if someone does have COVID and, and uh, diabetes, should they be checking their uh, blood glucose levels on a more frequent basis? I, I think it would be a good practice. I mean, patients with diabetes that check their blood sugar very often, patients with type 1, perhaps a bit more often than patients with type 2. And we should view that as a critical set of information to know how we're doing, right? So uh, if, if someone with diabetes has uh, a COVID-19 infection, should probably check the blood, the blood sugar way more often, yes. Dr. Perfetti, just another question on that. Um, I know we've talked so much about COVID-19, but what about any other um, illness that happens? Um, does that also make it more difficult to control blood sugar? It does. So it does. So the presence of a comorbidity of an infectious type of comorbidity changes a little bit the requirement of um, 
glucose lowering medication. And that needs to be always contextualized, right? Because in a setting of uh, an infection, in some patients, there is a gastrointestinal component, so they will eat less. So we cannot simply say, well, increase your treatment of X amount. It needs to be obviously very tailored, but generally speaking, uh, it's true also for other potential uh, infectious comorbidity in a patient with diabetes. For me, what, what is very important is what we were just saying, controlling blood sugar a little bit more often, but also to reevaluate uh, the therapy. I mentioned metformin that needs to be reevaluated, whether it should stay on during the acute phase, but also the same is for the class of drug called SGLT2 that will need to be reevaluated by the physician, whether they should be temporarily replaced with another treatment in the acute phase. Um, metformin is not indicated in patients with major organ uh, problems in the acute phase. And SGLT2 could mask a little bit the real uh, glucose level uh, because of its own mechanism of action. So if an individual with diabetes is treated with one of the members of this class. It's a very novel class, an excellent uh, set of medication. May need to be transiently switched to another treatment to make sure to manage any potential risk at the best possible way. Thank you. Um, this question submitted by Kevin. Um, is there a shortage of insulin or diabetes supplies? No, I don't believe so. So I, I know that all companies making uh, drugs for um, uh, diabetes, for glucose lowering, have issued some uh, communication to, to the public. And I just also verified that to the website of the American Diabetes Association. So we haven't registered any shortage. And also to keep in mind is that uh, the uh, pharmacies, uh, pharmacies have been open throughout the shutdown. If any individual uh, has a sense that that is the case, should signal that uh, uh, to the physician or to FDA, uh, because that is obviously a very important information. It's a public health uh, risk, and we should communicate to each other if that is the case. I'm not aware of a shortage of insulin. Great. Thank you. So our next question, also on diabetes and COVID, submitted by Martha. If I'm hospitalized with COVID, will I still be able to use my insulin pump and CGM to treat my type 1 diabetes? My preference would be yes. Um, I view patients who use a pump and a CGM as the patient who may more carefully be able to control plus sugar because as a real time management of uh, glucose. However, there may still be hospitals that are not super comfortable with that. So the situation may be addressed specifically with the hospital where someone is admitted. Uh, I personally, as an endocrinologist, uh, feel perfectly comfortable. I actually prefer uh, in some cases that people are managed also with a, a CGM because that gives me a, a real time, almost real time level of glucose in the bloodstream. I know that no hospital in the country and the dimension of this pandemic has been such that there have been so many people admitted. Not every hospital feels comfortable uh, and they would perhaps choose to switch to insulin injection, which is equally effective. And, uh, uh, but pump and CGM will be perfectly fine. But as far as you know, there's not a protocol, a consistent protocol across the U.S. for that. No, there is no, and what, no, there is, there is no, there is no medical reason other than the 
practicality of managing. So in some hospital setting, people may feel way more comfortable with an injection. Right. Okay. Good. Thank you. So our next question submitted by Jessica, Brittany, Dan, and, and several others, also on diabetes and COVID. Do we know the recovery and fatality rates for people with diabetes who contract COVID-19? And are the outcomes different for people, again, with type 1 or type 2 diabetes? Yeah, so on, on this um, important question, we have some elements of the puzzle, but not all elements of the puzzle. So we know that among people they get admitted in an hospital setting with a diagnosis of COVID-19, the percentage of those that uh, get hospitalized and who have also diabetes varies between 20 and 50 percent, which is obviously much greater than the prevalence of diabetes in the U.S. So then the question is how many of them may actually uh, progress and how many of them may actually be fatality. We consider that diabetes may increase the risk for the worst outcome of fatality between three to four fold compared to patients who don't have diabetes. So those are the data so far. Unfortunately, the denominator, so the number of overall people that get infected, is not yet available to us. But we certainly know that once patients with diabetes get symptomatic, not simply infected, the risk to progress is three to four fold greater than people who don't have diabetes. We're not aware of differences in outcome between patients with type one and type two because there are no comparative data that I've seen. However, as we said at the beginning, patients with type two often have multiple comorbidity. And that may make patients with type two carry the risk also that comes with hypertension and obesity and age. So patients with type two more often are older and patients with type 1. But we don't really have this real data will be available very soon. Uh, data, as I mentioned before, are being published uh, on a daily basis on COVID-19. Thank you. And one of the questions that we just had come across the chat is kind of a continuation of that. And I think you answered it, but I want to make sure it's clear for everyone. Um, the question was around, uh, is there a difference in outcomes if for people with diabetes that contract uh, COVID-19, for people that just have diabetes, or for people that have diabetes plus some other underlying conditions. And I think what you were saying was that the data is pretty clear that the outcomes typically are, are worse when there's uh, additional underlying conditions. Yes, I, yes, that, that is what we are observing, right? So if in addition to diabetes, we see hypertension, obesity, and age, older age. The risk is much greater than diabetes alone in a younger individual. Right. So specifically, those three conditions are the ones that seem to be the most indicative of a potentially poor outcome. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, what needs to be added to these three is cardiovascular disease, which is obviously what is relevant with this. What we have learned with COVID-19 uh, by the month of March, uh, so at least a month after in the U.S., we start becoming very alert on, on the disease, was that the respiratory symptoms are only the first wave of symptoms, but then what actually makes the prognosis very severe is multiple organ uh, failure. Uh, that may happen in some patients, in, in a small number of patients, but and the cardiovascular system is obviously the one that uh, is more susceptible. So even patients with a cardiovascular background are exposed at an increased 
Good, good. That's helpful. That's very helpful. Thank you. Melody, let's go to question 18 because I think that's a really important one that I want to make sure we cover. Great. So we have a couple of questions. Sorry, I'm sorry. I'm, in, I'm sorry. Question 17. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Also on um, the category of diabetes and COVID, um, submitted by Denise and Ken, when a vaccine is ultimately created, will it be recommended for people with diabetes? Uh, I sincerely hope so, because we understand that uh, patients with diabetes may have an evolution that is more severe. But I cannot answer that question in a definitive way because one of the objectives during the study of a vaccine is to learn not only if it's efficacious, but also if it's safe. Now, if a vaccine is developed for COVID-19, it will not be recommended for diabetes, I think would be a failure. I mean, this is patient, it's a critical patient population that we need to protect. So it will be a major disappointment. I have no reason that uh, a vaccine, if it developed, will not be um, amenable to be used for patients with diabetes. Patients with diabetes respond very well to immunization and immunization is one of the critical means to minimize the risk uh, over time. We do recommend, as I mentioned before, the flu vaccine every year, but also the pneumococcal vaccine for older uh, uh, individuals. So I have no reason to think that this would be a problem, but needs to be obviously demonstrated. Great, thank you. Can we, uh, can we go back one just to 16? Um, sure. I think this was kind of related to the outcomes that we were talking about earlier and um, controlling uh, blood sugar when somebody is in the hospital with COVID. Yeah, controlling blood sugar is, is important. And actually, it's a bit difficult to separate glucose from being diabetic. So um, we, we can certainly postulate that the quality of control may also have an impact on outcome. And in fact, there are some reports that are suggestive that patients with diabetes with a poor glycemic control who have symptoms may be the one more likely to progress toward a severe form of the disease. So um, <clears throat> the quality of control is very, very important uh, for, this, for patients with diabetes. I don't know if the question also meant to suggest that in the hospital setting may be more difficult to manage. <clears throat> uh, if, if that is also what the question was aiming to address, I think having COVID-19 makes managing glucose a little bit more difficult, but not, not off scale. I mean, it's just a matter of dosing. And uh, I mean, any, any physician should be able to manage glucose, even when in a COVID-19 situation may require a change in the dose or change in the treatment. So this is not something of scale from a medical point of view, but obviously needs to be a critical target management. So if there is a fatality from COVID-19, it's generally not because of the blood sugar control, it's some other outcome of the disease that... So, yes, okay. so however, so the reason for outcome is no glucose per se. We haven't seen patients with diabetes dying of uh, DKA, which is diabetic ketoacidosis, which is the coma we see in these patients. However, we need to consider that because their glucose control becomes more fragile, if infected by COVID-19 and becoming symptomatic, many of them could progress toward a condition that requires a very different glucose management. And if that does not happen, yes, they would become more susceptible also to potentially evolve as a result of the poor glucose control. But this should be 
uh, daily manageable. Got it. Thank you. And I know we're running close on time, but we've had so many great questions. Um, I do want to thank you, Dr. Perfetti, for being our guest today. The information you shared is very insightful and very helpful to so many, um, so many of our members and non-members as well. And we definitely appreciate your time. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Julie to talk about a few things. Sure. And um, I echo that. Dr. Perfetti, thank you so much for being able to share your time and expertise. Uh, I know that it's so invaluable for people to hear real talk about what's happening and to kind of cut through some of the noise, specifically around risk factors and diabetes and really understanding what that means for someone with diabetes. Um, we do have a couple of resources and we'll share these in the chat as well as um, in the follow-up email that you'll receive. A uh, couple of ones that were uh, vetted by Dr. Perfetti around the American Diabetes Association, the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation and some others. Um, we also invite you to uh, visit the Medical Alert Resource Center. We've created a, um, a whole uh, center that has information from vetted from very trusted sources for people that are living with specific chronic medical conditions as well as more general uh, coronavirus or COVID-19 uh, resources. So the next I believe is talking about, uh, and if you found some interesting things here, uh, we've had some other similar sessions recently, um, specifically talking around uh, COVID-19 and Alzheimer's, uh, what it means if you have asthma or allergies, COVID-19. We talked a little bit about autism last, a couple of weeks ago. And uh, we'll be continuing these sessions going forward in two weeks. Uh, we'll have uh, very uh, pleased to have Dr. Ira Nash, who's uh, executive director at Northwell Health, a prominent cardiologist uh, here in New York City. And he'll be talking about cardiovascular disease and COVID-19, I think, next to diabetes from the, uh, from the medical alert population, cardiovascular disease is really the other thing that uh, is a prominent condition among our members and among the general public, too. So we're very pleased to be able to, um, to have that uh, as one of our upcoming sessions. Please hang on for a quick survey. We'd like to hear from you on today's session. But a quick reminder, please don't forget to update your Medical Alert Health profile and emergency contacts. It's really important that we have the most update information in order to help you in an emergency. So if you take a moment, please, and answer the questions, that would be fantastic. We would really appreciate it. Again, I just wanted to say thank you so much, Dr. Perfetti. We're so grateful for, uh, for your insights and the amount of work that you, time you put into preparing for this session and answering all these great questions. So thank you again for being with us. Thank you. Thank you to MedAlert and uh, uh, happy to help. Thank you so much, Dr. Perfetti.